Hello and welcome to the Oregonian Sports Podcast. I'm Bill Oram, joined by Brenna Green from Coin6 News. Brenna, what's happening? Hello, hi. It's been a bit. We've both been very busy with our respective life duties, so there you go. Yeah, we missed a couple of weeks with some vacation work travels. Uh, we're back. We, um, I think we last podcasted at the start of the NCAA tournament or Correct. right after the opening weekend. Uh, we were giving a lot of favor when we talked about this last Brenna to the women's tournament. And there's, and let, let me let me just pause. There's a lot to talk about right now. There's yeah. you know, a lot happening right down I-5 at, in Corvallis at Oregon State. Uh, moment of crisis there. Blazer season is wrapping up. We're going to get to all of that. But first, I do want to acknowledge what we have all been transfixed by over the last three weeks, month, um, in the form of the NCAA tournament. You, obviously, on the men's side, the crown goes to UConn back to back. But the story of the spring has absolutely been the the rise and dominance of the women's game. And not to pat us on the back too much here, Brenna, but this is something we talked about going into the NCAA tournament, that this was the year of women's basketball, locally with Oregon State women, but then obviously on a much bigger scale with what we saw uh, happening across the country. Yeah, I mean, what a fun women's tournament. You know, I was I was here in I was here in Portland at the women's regional here. You know, unfortunately, we didn't have South Carolina or Iowa, which was kind of like the two big money ticket items, I guess you could say. But um, man, it was a lot of fun. It's always just pure chaos in those double regionals. <laughs> it's an interesting format to say the least, especially if you're mm-hmm. working it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it was it was just awesome to see the crowds and how excited people were and how into it people were, and uh, you know, three point three point line regardless. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was that was interesting. Well, and okay, so I won't be the first person to use to say this, and I won't be the last. But um, women's championship game viewership numbers eighteen point seven million. Men's tournament championship numbers fourteen point eight two million in prime time on TBS. Um, what do you think this moment means for women's basketball, and what is this going to look like next year and 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 years down the road? I mean, to what extent was this a a product of having hugely visible um, stars? Uh, you know, Caitlin Clark certainly captured the imagination uh, in a way that is not common. You know, is she the greatest player of all time to come through? Probably not, but she did things that were really exciting to watch and kind of mm-hmm. and hit the cultural zeitgeist. Um, what do you think it looks like next year? Are we going to see the women continue to outpace the men in terms of viewership and interest going forward? I'm not sure if it will outpace, but I think it'll be pretty even. Um, the women's game still has so many household names that are still going to be around. I mean, Paige is coming back next year. That's a huge person to come back. Yep. Um, and then, uh, you know, then you've got, you've got Juju who's totally on the rise. She is going to be, she is going to keep ascending and ascending. And now she gets off, even though we are going to, we're going to miss it. She gets off that dang Pac-12 network. Yeah. So the country can actually see her now. Whereas before she was pretty much isolated to, you know, if you had cable. So, um, so that's going to be huge for her. Absolutely huge. And you got a few other people that are kind of ascending at a similar time. So, um. I think that they still will have a lot of momentum going into next year for sure. Um, and I think, you know, is what it is. But one of the things that really I think works for the women's game is the fact that unlike the men, there's not this one and done model happening. You know, mm-hmm. there's they can build momentum over time. Whereas in the men's game, that's so difficult. And it's honestly just. It's even more rare in the men's game that kids stay at the same place for a certain for more than two years, you know. So, um, so you just maybe like, a, maybe yeah. a, maybe a bad example for our listeners who are are currently seeing the exodus happening at Oregon State. But yes, absolutely, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, yes, there are there are multiple um, people who are just you know, it's it's just more common for women to stay in the same place than men. And um, it's just for whatever reason um, in the women's game. And like I said, they just they're able to build a little bit more consistency. And whenever whenever when you're able to build that consistency, 
it leads to this. So, you know, we'll we'll see how things go. But um, right now, the women's game is in a really good spot. And I wouldn't be surprised if the men and the women are on par for viewership next year. Yeah, and I think I think what I feel like this year did was it was sort of an it was sort of the the final final or first I'm not even sure but it was it feels like the great evening of the NCAA tournament yes. and of of women's college basketball where women's college basketball pulled itself up to the level where you know and men's college basketball has kind of stagnated obviously it has you know one of the greatest products in the in in sports in March Madness but as an overall product from November through you know up through the, through the regular season I don't know how watchable of a sport it is or how popular of a sport it is to your your average sports fans. I think I think the women's game has has established itself as an equal to to mm -hmm. the men's game. The the quality of play is exceptionally high. The stars are fantastic. Um you have you have coaches now who have you know, in the men's game, we've seen a lot of the longtime established coaches who were the faces of the sport, you know, kind of move out of the way. In the women's mm -hmm. game, you still have the vast majority of those recognizable uh, figures in Gino, Kim Mulkey, and up until yesterday, Tara Vanderveer, who finally retired after 39 years to Stanford. But, um, you know, I think that that in terms of viewership and interest and compelling narratives um, matters as well. Like Kim Mulkey being, you know, quote unquote villain in a lot of people's eyes um, or, you know, however you want to look at uh, her kind of role in the landscape, she draws eyeballs and she is someone you want to see what's going to happen next. And her teams are really great. And so I think having characters and figures like that who have crossed into the mainstream is huge for the women's game. And so really excited to see from where it goes from here. Um, excited that the NCAA seems to be moving toward providing uh, tournament shares going forward. Um, I hope so. So that there's a real financial piece to this as well, um, because the women's game has has really just taken that step. Um, okay, hmm. uh, we are we need like sad music now, I guess, or oh we need we need like we, yeah, we need like a, to the a, a little game. Vi a, a little violin playing. Well, okay, so you and I were in Corvallis a couple of weeks ago. Oregon mm -hmm. State was hosting an NCAA uh, the first two rounds, beat Nebraska. Obviously, went on to the Elite Eight and and played a really tough game against South Carolina. Since then, what has happened at Oregon State University, the largest state university? You mean in or, I think you said Oregon? State. You said Nebraska. I think you meant to say Oregon State played a really tough game against South Carolina. I did. I did mean Oregon State. If I said Nebraska, I was saying that Oregon State walloped <laughs> Nebraska, then moved on to the Elite Eight and played a really tough game against uh, South Carolina, um, the inevitable and uh, eventual champion. Um, yeah, tough times at Oregon State. So since in the last week, Oregon State has lost from its women's team uh, to Leah Von Olhoffen to the transfer portal. Talia was the uh, emotional leader and the heartbeat of that of that elite eight team graduate transfer going to pursue uh, her final year somewhere else. Uh, to Mia Gardner, who is probably set to be that team's leading scorer and most reliable scorer next year, uh, lethal jump shooter. Um, all American caliber player. She is in the portal today. Adley Blacklock, who is an important reserve on that team and a really good three point shooter, went in the portal. There are more coming, I believe and expect. Yeah. Um, so that's women's basketball. Men's basketball, Jordan Pope and uh, ah. Tyler Billado are the two you need to know. But uh, Oregon State is left with about five scholarship players at the exact moment. Um, when you know, Wayne Tinkle, who is still living off that extension he got after the Elite Eight run in 2021, you know, the whole goal coming into the offseason was trying to uh, hang on to some of those players and yeah. um, and build. Because Oregon State, Brenna, you know, was not unwatchably bad in men's basketball this year. No, they that's lost a, good a lot moments. of games. It's a good moments. You know, they were really competitive in games that they ended up losing. Jordan Pope was an all-conference player and got snubbed, frankly, from the top two all-conference teams. That's men's basketball. And then in football yesterday, the uh, the the Chinook of all the fish on campus. Wow, we're the, really the, going you know, the, for no, this analogy. No, the, the Herman the Sturgeon of the fish in the pond at Oregon State, Damian Martinez, the face of the resistance, um, 
and it announces that he's going to enter the portal as well. And Oregon State loses its, you know, again, you know, Doak Walker candidate um, running back. And it just seems, Brenna, that Oregon State is is helpless to do anything mm, about yeah. the exodus that is happening there. And I, I, I guess the I, we can sit here and we can lament realignment and we can lament the fact that maybe Oregon State's NIL um, situation is not as sophisticated as other schools. Although, I mean, like I, I've, I've spoken to the folks at, at Damn Nation, like I think they have their, you know, their stuff together for the most part. They have a philosophy. They have a strategy. Um, there was a number reporter, Damian Martinez, that he was set to make 400,000 um, at Oregon State next year. That number has been somewhat disputed. But um, if we use that as a starting point, like that's a really aggressive NIL, you know, figure from Oregon State for a single player, um, even though it's a really important player. Um what can Oregon State do? And I don't have the answer, so I'm curious to see if you do, because it'd be mm. it'd go a long way to sorting this out. What can Oregon State do to um, kind of pull itself back up? Because it seems like it's almost a complete flush of what they have had and, and who they have and who they've been kind of across the board now. It's going to take a few years. I... Mm -hmm. It's just it's. It... These people are leaving because they want to compete in the highest conferences in the nation and be against the best competition and give themselves the best shot to win championships and give themselves the best shot for um, exposure, which then gives themselves the best shot to make NIL money. And so they're in a rough spot. Like, and that's the reason why, you know, I think, I think they're going to go with the CW for their TV deal. That's what's been reported because... They want to have some, at least some sort of national broadcast for their football, which is which is a mm -hmm. cool concept. Um, but yeah, like it's, I don't, I don't know if there's much they can really do right now. Like it's just hard. They're they're a damaged brand, and when you're a damaged brand, that is not something that just flips overnight, and it's not mm -hmm. damaged through their own doing. That's the thing that's really hard. It's like it's not like you guys did something. You know, like it's not like something nefarious happened. It's just there's because of how everything went down, the narrative about them and Wazoo is that they're just not a big time college athletics brand. And because of that, you're in a, it's it's gonna it's it's not something that can change overnight. It is just not. And I mean, you know, I am I know that the WCC is not what they're used to competing against in terms of basketball. I get that. You know, I have some, I, I, I obviously know that conference probably better than almost anybody else. Um, I, so I can understand what, what's going on there, but it's still just really tough. It's, I don't know. I don't think the WCC is that bad, but I, I, I don't blame anybody for wanting to get out of there. So, yeah. Well, I, you've been playing in, you've been playing in one of the, you know, the, the WCC is a mid-major conference, and you know, it obviously, is. there is there is a school there that has mm -hmm. elevated itself yeah. above above mid-major status. But the conference yeah. is is still a mid-major. It's still a mid-major conference, and if any other 100%. any other any other school you know reaches the tournament from there, they are considered a mid-major. So, um, and that's in funding, label, whatever else. Um, Maybe St. Mary's men aren't considered that way, but that's it. <sighs> maybe but even even like st mary's is like a really high level mid-major program would be my but again yeah yep semantics but um the oregon state thing is interesting because they talk about continuing to operate as a power five they're going to spend like a power five they're going to they're going to fight and for the funding to continue to operate as a power five and and so there is a walk the walk talk the talk sort of attitude there as I think they try to swim upstream a little bit and and wait out what the rest of the college landscape ends up ends up doing, you know, does something break free somewhere else where Oregon State does find itself, you know, part of a, a grander plan as conferences either expand or contract and then or yeah. as they rebuild the Pac-12, um, you know, when we talk about like you know the Boise States of the world and the and the, a, another program that is a mid-major but you know 
in f- football wise for a long time has has punched above its weight financially punches above the weight of like the lower spenders in in in, in the Mountain West Conference right there's a disparity in funding at a school like Boise State and a school like San Jose State and so you know Oregon State you know if you can rebuild the Pac-12 in time with the you know the the Boise States of the world and put together a little bit of a conference is that a power five conference once you're done? I mean, probably not, but it's also not a, you know, it's not a, you know, diluted Mountain West conference. So I think Oregon State, you know, for as as, as unpleasant as it is to think about, is going to just be kind of in this awkwardness for a few years while it tries yeah. to kind of keep its head above water and find the best path. And I don't know that I can blame athletes for not for wanting to be in a more stable situation. That said, I'm not entirely sure how different, functionally different the experience is if you're on a, if you are getting the same amount of NIL money at Oregon State as you might elsewhere, which in some situations I think was going to be the case. Um you know, I I think there's a lot of you know, any one of these players might have left under normal circumstances. You know, any you know, one of the football players who left in the fall might have left even if Jonathan Smith had stayed. Um, you know, Tamia Gardner, you know, is a star. She might have been um she might have been uh persuaded to leave anyway. Um mm-hmm. to leave on Olhoffen as a graduate transfer, but that's something we've seen in the sport for a long time. You know, like I don't blame her for after you know putting in four seasons, you know, wanting to experience something somewhere else. Like this is her if she wants to go play at UConn, she probably can go play at UConn. And like you that's an opportunity like this is your last chance to make that decision in your life. So I do I do get it on like the individual case by case basis. I think for Oregon State, it's just the totality of it all that makes it yeah. so difficult. But I think what's interesting is you look at let's say that Damian Martinez number of four hundred thousand is correct. One, I think that is dwarfed by what is available in, you know, the Big Ten SEC when you're talking about a you know, a high, a top, a top level running back and what that, what is going to be available to a player of that caliber. So there's that, but two, you know, for for the Oregon state collective, that's a huge investment. And I, I just, I think it is, it tells a pretty compelling story that, that for on an NIL standpoint, your very best or the most that you can put out there isn't enough because it's not just NIL that you're competing against as Oregon state. It's, it's the fact it's the the damaged brand like you said that you know players don't see Oregon State as that high level anymore and maybe it was low level high level before but it gave you a chance to compete against those top schools and now it does not exactly it's yeah it's 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 all about weathering the storm down there at this point there's just you've got to just get through this period and hope that it you know hope that your coaches have put you in a position to succeed at the level that you guys are going to be at next and then go from there. Uh-huh. Cause there's, there's nothing you can really do right now to stop these kids from going. Uh, like you said, nobody can blame them. You know, it's, they want to go compete against the best, of the best. And if they have the opportunity to do that, like how can anybody say no? But I really do feel for Oregon state fans. It feels like every time, I mean, and by the way, that Martinez thing, I mean, just based off quotes from literally yesterday before it broke, didn't seem like anybody down there had any idea. Um, Damian Martinez, yeah, because so yesterday the Oregon State running backs coach and uh, Jam Griffin, who came back after a year uh, yeah. away from the program, you know, spoke ab- about Damian Martinez as though he was going to be there. Yeah, I mean, I mean... <sighs> Jam called them a dynamic duo. I have the exact quote here. Um, And then Thomas Ford, their running back coach, said, to hear about a guy who wants to be a beaver means a lot to not just me, but the program. It shows that there's not just the transactional aspect. These guys care about their relationships. They care about their community. Having guys come back to the fold is very special for sure. And that is him talking about Damian Martinez and Jam. So, um... It and that was, I mean, literally, I think an hour after that interview was when it broke that he was leaving. And I think that there was there were actually some rumblings happening kind of around that time, like kind of simultaneously. The yes, thing with Damian agreed. Martinez, I lost my pen. 
Hold on a second. Sorry. I need a pen to twirl while I talk and make these excellent points. Um, <laughs> the thing with Damian Martinez that always sort of surprised me was how emphatic he was about staying at Oregon State and when he was so emphatic. He, the, he first said it through in a story that was written by Joe Freeman of the Oregonian back in November. That story ran the week of um, the Oregon game. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking it felt foolish or premature for Damian Martinez to make that sort of pledge at that time because there was so much swirling around Jonathan Smith. We didn't have a schedule for next season yet. Um, And I just was like, this feels like the sort of thing that comes back to bite somebody when they say it in this time. And so he said it before Jonathan Smith left. And then he reiterated it after Jonathan Smith left. And then kind of throughout, you know, he's been, you know, the beaver for life stuff. And I, I get why fans feel stung by this one in particular. Yeah, this one feels particularly damaging. Because you did have somebody who said, I don't care. I don't care who we're playing. I don't care who the coach is. Um, I want to be a beaver. Like it, what, what this program has done for me means so much to me. I'm going to be here. And so then to lose that guy, I think is, you know, it just raises questions about, well, how can you, you sell anybody on what you have to offer? If, if that guy who's so bought in, which by the way, ignores all the factors that are happening around these athletes, you know, the third parties, the middlemen, you know, the, uh, and I'm not Life saying problems. specific knowledge of, of, um, of, 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 of Damian yeah. Martinez's situation, yeah. but you just don't know um, who was talking to him, who was advising him, what sort of influence he was getting. And so it ends up being a total, you know, mystery. And, you know, it leads to a situation where he's going to go find somewhere else to play. And that it just is really hurtful to, I think, a university and a brand that is looking for leaders and, and people that kind of are willing to take on the challenge of being um, in the eye of the storm. Well, you know, the thing... The thing that um, really stood out to me is that um, when Talia when Talia hit the portal, I was like, "She's their voice in a lot of their commercials. Like a lot of the Bieber Athletics commercials has Talia von Olhoffen's voice in it, talking about being a Beeb and and how much it means to her." So, I I just thought about the fact. It's like they're gonna have to pull all those commercials now, because it's not Talia anymore. And you know, she said that there's other issues and other other things that um that are at play here. But yeah, it's it's tough. I mean, it really did feel like Talia and Damien were kind of the center of the resistance. They're, they're it's like the center can't hold anymore. And once those two cut off, it kind of feels like. Man, it's it could be a free for all, um, and I mean it kind of has been, um, but yeah, it's um, it's those two, Talia and Damien, certainly felt like the two who were kind of leading the rallying cry, and once you lose those two, it just it's rough. It's rough. It's rough. If you were at an Oregon State game this year, there was a huge you know push of you know. To Leah von Olhoffen leading like a, a group of athletes saying, you know, we are we want to do it for Oregon. And, you know, and, and Jordan Pope was in that as well. And so, I mean, that was, you know, kind of the core group that was, um, you know, at the face of this. And like I called it the resistance earlier with Damian Martinez. And I think I've used that to describe kind of the Oregon State women's team sticking together after a really tough last year. But, um, you know, you just sort of kind of believed that these were the people who were going to stick it out for Oregon state. And fa- I think fans kind of looked to that in a time when, you know, fans, alums, donors, I mean, it's not just, you know, the emotional side of it. There is something tangible to it, you know, as they're kind of trying to get through this mess. So I do have a different perspective on one thing now. And I mean, I kind of thought it in the moment, but now it feels even more real to me. Um, Scott Ruick's opening statement after losing to South Carolina was uh fiery to say the mm-hmm. least. I mean, he was really going. Uh, he was upset about um 
I think he was upset about the fact that after they beat Notre Dame, all anybody talked about was the girl who had the nose ring and having getting getting subbed out because mm-hmm. they wanted to take her take her off the nose or they wanted her to take off the nose ring and that was a big topic yeah. conversation. Nobody sure. was talking about his team, but I mean now I'm looking at this statement from him after he after they lost and it almost looks like he's like I got to go into recruiting mode for my team right mm-hmm. now. You know, it's fearless, courageous together. Everything that is right is this team. In our sport where it seems like controversy is a flavor all the time for some reason and we all have yeah. to have something to whine about. This team just keeps it simple and does everything right. Y'all are probably bored with it. Shame on you. That's what I'd say. Everybody needs to get to know this team. Everybody needs to watch this team, and everyone needs to be like this team. The world would be better if everyone focused on this instead of a lot of the other things. I couldn't be more proud of a group, more happy to be a part of them, and more grateful. And, yeah, now I just see that as it almost feels like, in my eyes, he was going into recruiting mode for his own team the second they lost because he knew what was coming. And so he got up there and he gave this speech. I, I really haven't seen Scott Ruick speak with that sort of fire. I don't, I don't know, ever. And so it just really struck me in the moment is this is kind of different. And I kind of had that thought of, is he doing this because what could be coming next? And it just seems more and more like that might be the case, that he was using the podium as a way to re-recruit his whole team. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see how well that works at varying levels. But um, I think you're probably right. I also think, though, I, I, I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm really, in, I would love to be in Scott Ruick's head right now. Because, yeah. because he has built such a, you know, sustainably good program, mm-hmm. you know, at a place where, you know, you wouldn't have, it hasn't existed historically. And this team was built to do something potentially really special next year. Like, you know, yeah. I don't think it, it would not have been unre if they kept the group together or the bulk of the group together, I don't think it would have been unreasonable to talk about, Hey, could they, could they, you know, not just a final four, but playing for a national championship. You know, they, there was that kind of potential even playing in the WCC. Um, and mm-hmm. the, you know, my understanding is that there were you know things lined up for you know a really robust non conference schedule, and and maybe that will still exist depending on what this ends up looking like. But um, you know, this was going to be a national level program still, even in the WCC. And uh, you know, people say, well, would Scott Ruick leave? I mean, Scott Ruick is the ultimate beaver. You know, he loves being at Oregon State. You know, he's all about. You know, he's all about um, Oregon State's place culturally um as a as a you know as an educational institution like he's all about the oregon state oregon rivalry like he is he's kind of like i mean it's so cliche but like bleeding orange and black like that is scott ruick would scott ruick leave you know the answer would almost always be no way but i do wonder i mean if depending on how bad this exodus gets i mean will scott ruick look at this and say how do we you know how do we win here if we yeah. can't keep players coming off of this team, how do we win here? Um, that's really concerning. I also wonder, you know, like you said, certainly I don't think he was blind to what was potentially coming. But that same press conference you're talking about, he received several questions about keeping the team together. Yeah. And being so young and coming back next year. And there was one point where he said in that press conference, you know, and we could find the quote or the clip, but he said something like, you know, I guess I just don't see what you guys see. And I, I wonder if, you know, because the questions are kind of framed through the lens of, you know, the the thing you would anticipate is that players would potentially leave or that they would get poached yeah. from other schools. And he was like, and he was like, I don't know why you think that would happen. And so I do wonder if he was in some ways too trusting that this group would stick together and not fearful enough of the landscape because it is a cutthroat vicious world and there's a lot of money being thrown around and i wonder if there are parts of that that he wasn't quite expecting i think i think the 
I, I think I have the quote pulled up here when he, he says, it's my university, so I care. One thing I'll say, it's hard hearing your school talked about in a way it's been talked about, in the way it's been talked about, and in a way devalued. Clearly, I don't see it that way. Mm -hmm. To turn a community and region on its ear has been a dream of mine. We've done that. We've done it at the highest level. We've gotten to this point a couple times now. What the value is, I don't know, but I know the timing of it's really great. Blah, 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 blah. It's been a joy of mine. I shouldn't say blah, 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 blah. You all know what I mean. I'm just... I'm just uh, trying to summarize. It's been a joy of mine to put smiles on people's faces, especially this year. Um, There's... It's, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, you, you do have to wonder. You do have to wonder. Like, I mean, that's, that's just, that's just called sports now. Like, you can't, I'm, I don't think either of us are saying that he's going to bounce, but I mean. I mean, the, the, you know? the game has changed. Exactly. The game, and, and not basketball like the game around the game has changed like the yes you know the things that have become standardized and legalized and the and the number of people who now have a f their finger in the pie and the things and you know people like you know there's the discourse on this is so toxic because you know one person will say well it's bad for college sports that players don't say don't stay and somebody else will say well don't you care about don't you care about the athletes and both things can be true you know and i i think you know there is just a sort of careening out of control element to college sports right now where, yeah. you know, there isn't oversight. There isn't any great control over this stuff. Like, like does, does college football need a salary cap? Like, I don't know, but it just seems like if, if Alabama can pay and Alabama just is, is a convenient, you know, choice, but like, you know, can pay X number of dollars, at, you know, because of whatever you know mechanisms it has in place through NIL and institutional advantages it has, and you know, uh, you know let's even just say Utah, Utah, which is a really, really, really good program playing in the Big Twelve that is never going to have those same resources, you know, is a power now for school, you know, it's never going to be, there's never going to be competitive balance for a for a, a university like Utah, and like in every in all in across sports competitive balance is something that we value yeah and like it seems like in college football and then it trickles down to other college sports we're so comfortable having the haves and the have nots and i understand it's tougher to regulate you know 120 whatever it is college football pro division one college football programs and you can't say alabama can only spend as much on you know nil as troy can spend on nil but it just it, it it's not a fair landscape and fair is subjective but it just it doesn't make sense it doesn't seem like the spirit of sports and again there have been institutional advantages forever you know corvallis is never going to be you know westwood but i i just don't quite understand where college sports goes from here it's it's you know the the thing i will say about the ncaa tournament it was such a joy to watch and it frankly felt like a respite from all this mm -hmm. other stuff because the world of college sports sucks. Yep. But the product of college sports, even with players being, you know, on their third school in three years or whatever it is, like the product is still good. And it's still fun to like invest in a season and a team or a tournament. And, and, you know, that's what college sports has going for it is that sports are still cool. Yeah, I mean, I I grew up on college sports. That's what my household was. We were not a pro household. We were all about college sports. Like that's what we watched. And so, it. You're right about the NCAA tournament, kind of reminding us, like, oh yeah, this is why we're here. Actually, for the sports, not like the talk about NIL money and all this other stuff, which is you know understandable, but it's exhausting. It's exhausting. Like. You know, nobody gets into what you and I do because we want to report on people jumping in the transfer portal and NIL money. That is that that's that's not it at all. You know, I like I covered um, the whole situation with Nick Rolovich at Wazoo when he uh, refused to get vaccinated. I did not get into this business because I wanted to talk about coaches and whether or not they had vaccines or not. OK, so sometimes these things are just things that come along with our job. 
but I think the vast majority of people who are into college sports and the vast majority of people who cover college sports, this is not really like why we got into this. We got into this for the games and the people that you get to know over a course of time. And, you know, that is progressively and progressively losing its zest because nobody's at one place too long. And like I said, you know, the, the women's game has the benefit of stability or, and it's not totally stable by any means, but like, at least you have a few years to get to know somebody, you know, in this college landscape right now, I mean, everybody's just in and out and I, I get it. I'm not blaming anybody. It's what you have to do to stay alive. But the people who really suffer are the fans uh, who, you know, they're going to be Beavers fans no matter what. They don't care who's on their team. But you know what? It would make it a lot better if you actually know the people on your team and, like, know that they're good people. That helps, certainly. And right now, with everybody just coming and going and, and everything like that, it's just... It's exhausting. It's exhausting to have to keep up with as a reporter, so I can't even imagine as a fan. Because you're just... You're like, all right, who's here today? Who's leaving today? Like... It's just a lot right now. It's it's hard to build fervor for something when you're starting from ground zero every year. Yeah. NBA and, teams and, don't do that. Well, and you know? that's the thing. It's like, you know, yeah, I don't know. Uh, Brenna, I have a question, and this will only be of interest to our viewers who um, mm. are, are on YouTube, not our listeners through the apps. But uh, He's been out of control today. I'm not talking about your cat. Okay. Well, In this exact moment, but... Why are you wearing a name tag? Oh, yes. I was at career day for my high school before this. Did you? F- I forgot I had find- that on entirely. Did you find a new career? <laughs> Working on it. No. Um, no, I talked to, talk to kids about being in broadcasting. So there you go. I warned them of all of the, uh, all the, all the difficult things. I told them about all the things that people don't see on television. So I probably, um, I probably ruined a few dreams today. So I'm sorry if I did that. Uh, but no, it was good. It was good. So yeah, I talked to juniors and sophomores about being in broadcasting. Thank you for reminding me that this is currently on my person. And now I will take this off of my person. There you go. Run a green class of 2010. Wow. Um, yeah. Okay, Beavers. Helping the youth of America. Dumpster fire. You lifting every every voice. Um, before we go, I uh, wanted to carve out a few minutes here to talk Blazers. Mm-hmm. The Blazers of the National Basketball Association, the Portland Trail Blazers, which just, there is an epidemic of people spelling Trail Blazers with, without a space and a capital B. It's two words. What? Like, why do I see this all the time? Just across, like, various forms of media, certainly social media, like Trailblazers, capital T-R-A-I-L-B-L-A-Z-E-R-S. Um, capital B, space. It's a huge pet peeve. I don't know why it's so hard for people. Um, I don't even the... like them being called the Zers. Okay, the Zers is preposterous. And the handful of people who call them the Zers uh, can can stop because that is I'm so glad that we're on the same page about this I knew I liked you for a reason I've seen this from time to time the Zers uh it does not work it is out no 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 you know there is no character limit so restrictive that you can't figure out how to get the three more three more letters in there okay um the Blazers have 21 wins they are they have three games left if they were to lose their final three games, they would be tied with the 2005-06 Blazers and the 1972-1973 Blazers for the worst record in franchise history. Um, I was on the radio today and got asked if this was the worst season in Blazers history of my lifetime, and I said, no question. Um, even though statistically, it still has a chance to not be quite as bad as the 2005-06 season. I was going to say, uh, that was that was during my childhood, and that was rough, man. It was, but I went back and looked, because I was trying to think about it. And I was like, why does that season not sound seem as miserable to me? And obviously, they got Brandon Roy in the draft, and so there was it kind of went away very quickly. Yeah. It was the first year Nate McMillan was the coach. 
So it was a hard reset of kind of everything they were doing. So they had Nate, you know, these that now I was always going to pull up the starting lineup of that, of that Blazers opening night starting lineup uh, back when the NBA season started in early November, like a, uh, like a, like it should in a polite society. Um, okay. The Blazers starting lineup that night. You know what? Don't look, this is a game. We're turning it into a game. It's a podcast. Podcasts are fun. I will okay. give you five points for every. I will give you 10 points for every starter that you can name from opening night, November 2nd, 2005 against the Minnesota Timberwolves. Every blazer starter you can name from that game. Yeah. And I'll give you five points for every reserve. Oh boy. Who played in that game. I could name a few. And if you get 50 points, you win the game. You need 50 points to win the game. Ruben Patterson was a starter. Came off the bench. Came off the bench. Okay, I'm close. Zach Randolph? Hold on, I need to, I need to rethink my, my rules for this game. If okay. you identify someone as a starter, does it... Okay, here's what we're going to do. I want you to name the starters, and then we will see where you are, and then we will go with reserves. Okay? Okay. So, give, give, me, give, me, give me starters. Okay, uh, Damon Stoudemire? He was gone. Gone. Bonzi Wells still here? He was gone. Dang! See, look at this. Is this I'm gonna is rough. Uh, you, you you did get Zach Randolph though, which, which is ten. So you, you're okay. at ten. Uh, Steve Blake. Not a not a, he's not a starter. Not a starter. This is gonna be this is gonna be rough. How many guesses? Um, you're, at, you're at you're at four guesses. I know. Not counting your you're actually at five guesses, but I'll give you one more. Racking my brain for former Blazers. So it probably don't matter. Um, 2005, 2000, there's some names here of people who I would say matter. There's there's some yeah. Blazers of Blazers of uh, Blazers of note still to come. Yes. You haven't yes. You haven't uh, neglected them all. Yes. One more um, guess at the starter, or do you want to just move to the reserves? I feel I feel um, inadequate right now. Um, okay. okay. Let's see here. So you, but I feel like I should know more of this. Like I feel you, like you will. It's this. Yeah, I didn't no, prep I'm going to be this. kicking myself soon. Um, mm, 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 mm. All right. I don't know. Okay. So you you lost the game. You didn't get fifty points. Yeah, um, no, I definitely lost. The starting okay. lineup for the Portland 14. Trail Blazers. I was thirteen. The Blazers started that game. Zach Randolph, you had uh, in the backcourt. They started the dynamic tandem of Sebastian Telfair. Oh yay! And Charles Smith. Nope, wouldn't have got that one. Uh, I believe. Uh, the Blazers had some injuries at the start of that year. Steve Blake and Travis Outlaw and Martel Webster were all out. So would Martel okay. Webster have started at the two probably back in those days? Um, and then, although that was probably, that was his rookie year. So who knows? Um, and then the, the, uh, Joel Prisbilla was the starting center. Great Blazer, Joel Prisbilla. Would have never got there, but we do, we do remember him fondly. And then you had Zach Randolph, and the three was Darius Miles. Okay, yep, no, I would not have gotten anybody there. I was at a Blazers game at the end of, it was either the end of that season, or I think it was the season before. It was the year Darius Miles had gotten traded from uh, Cleveland to the Blazers midseason. And this was in the days when, like, the team would go, like, clean out their lockers and, like, throw all their extra stuff into the stands, like fan appreciation night. And I Mm. caught a shoe from Darius Miles. So I have a Darius Miles shoe. So, you know, I used to go to Blazers kids camp back in the day. And you know that they used to, one of the prizes they used to give out was player shoes. That's so, great. yeah, I know. Isn't that a great prize? Definitely not something you do now. Um, yeah, like if you were like the camper of the day, you got a pair of Brian Grant shoes. Or you got, or like they'd give out practice jerseys too. I got, I don't know where it went. I'm very upset about this. By the way, no idea where it went, but I did receive a Bonzi Wells practice jersey. 
used to be a big Bonzi Wells fan. Uh, the, the Timberwolves starters in that game, by the way, since uh, oh, we're gosh. taking this little trip down memory lane. Why not? Kevin, Gar- Kevin Garnett, Wally Zerbiak. And then the next three never would have gotten uh, Marco Yarich, Trenton Hassel, and Michael Ola Candy. No. Trenton Hassel, never. by the way, a great former almost blazer. Do you remember that one? No. No? Trenton Hassel signed a offer sheet with the Trailblazers, but the Timberwolves had a certain number of days to match, and so they matched, mm-hmm. and Trenton Hassel never came to Portland, but he signed an offer sheet to be a Blazer. Uh, fun fact. Not even fun. Not a fun fact at all. So, okay, so I've, I've gotten Sounds off track Ro- here. Sounds very Roy Hibbert-esque, anyways. But that, that was the last time the Blazers were uh, a 21-win team, and I have some memories of that team. Uh, probably more than you appear to, <laughs> but what um, do we like? Why does the, I, in my opinion, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, it seems like this team this year is resonating even less. Like I just cannot recall a time when like a blazer season was more of an afterthought locally. And obviously like we've had, like we're coming off of, you know, 11 years of Damian Lillard. So obviously those years don't count. So now we're going farther back, but why in your opinion does, has this season been such a, um, such a nothing burger? Maybe it just has to do with the fact that like, we live in a world now where you have access to everything at all times. So, you know, back in the mid two thousands, it was like, well, this is our team. Mm -hmm. And now it just, you know, if your team isn't good, it's like, well, I still can watch 30 other NBA teams tonight, you know, whatever. Um, hmm. So I, I think that that might be a part of it. Just people don't have to mourn things as much. You know, it's kind of like it's it, it, yeah, it's just it's just different in terms of that. So that. That may be a part of it. Um, you know, generally, like, I think another thing that this team really does lack is like a steady vocal leader like player wise at the very least you know like you know Anthony Simons is a great guy he's not the spokesman that Damian Lillard was and that's just not his personality that's fine you know a 19 year old fresh off the G League team cannot do that a you know DeAndre Ayton bounces to his beats to his own drum but he's he's not gonna be that he's not gonna be that person. Um, you know, Malcolm Brogdon is a very like calm, steady force, but he's not you know, who knows how long he's gonna be here. Um which nobody can blame him for that. Um, so there's just I think that's another thing. There's not someone that has been totally embraced by the community like that you know jeremy grant another really cool guy but that's not that's not what he's gonna be so i think that's another thing there's just nobody that really like speaks to this town on that team in a way that can in a way that can cut through everything else that's going on especially in the way that damien could so that would make sense to me what do you think yeah well i think there's a lot of layers to it i think you hit on a lot of them i mean i think i think the 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 game has changed in the NBA. I'm going to keep using that phrase apparently. Um, since the Blazers the game were last done bad. changed. Since the Blazers were last truly bad, um, you know, you know, tanking rose to prominence. You know, in the mid 2010s, early 2010s, and the Blazers had Damian Lillard. And so the league, you know, a lot of teams have gone through painful cycles, sort of similar to this. Um, what makes the Blazers a little different, I think, is you know. You know, and like there were a couple of times in what you were just saying where you kind of said, like, he can't do it like Dame did, or he's not going to do it like Damien did. And I think that we are still in sort of the shock of Damien Lillard not being here phase, mm-hmm. um, where it's natural to compare these players and personalities and the relationships with Damien Lillard. And nobody's going to live up right away. That's just not realistic. No. Also, Damien Lillard was traded a week before the season started. So it was like, yeah. boom, DeAndre Ayton was dropped in, like, kind of out of nowhere. You know, Malcolm Brogdon was dropped in, boom, during training camp. And it's like, you know, there wasn't time, I don't think, for um, the city or the fan base to 
get to know players before all of a sudden it's like it's the season. And yep. you know, I do think that sort of like building some of that familiarity and anticipation matters. But also, I mean, you know, we're in a world where, you know, Anthony Simons hasn't played more than 62 games in three years and he's played 46 games this season. Um, you know, Jeremy Grant has not you know, played a meaningful minute of basketball in Portland, you know, in terms of, you know, a, yeah. in terms, in terms of this team going anywhere. Yes. Um, you know, he's the, he's the highest paid player on the team. DeAndre Ayton's the highest paid player on the team, but they signed him to a very lucrative contract in the off season, you know, and, and, you know, he, he's not playing because, you know, it doesn't really suit the, the interests of, of the, of the franchise right now. And so it's, it's just like, this is the third straight year that if you're a fan, that the team is kind of shut down after the all-star break. And I think you do, there is, and that is not what happened, um, you know, 17, 18 years ago. And, yeah. and so, you know, I think this is, a, this is just, it's, it's hard to process. I don't know that it means that the Blazers are, um, are failing as an organization or that, you know, it's, you know, the fault of Joe Cronin or, you know, whatever else. I mean, you know, there is, there has to be a kind of a patient approach here and it is painful and I, I don't enjoy it. I've never been more detached from an NBA season probably in my professional life. I mean, that's probably, I mean, I covered the NBA directly for most of it, so that's probably um, Hmm. inevitable, but you know, I, I think, you know, Scoot Henderson comes in with huge expectations, you know, He's a little bit of a slow start. So people look away from him because it's like, oh, he's not living up to those expectations. We look away. Well, he's actually been playing pretty well. You know, he, he had 19 been. points and 15, 15 assists last night against the Pelicans. You know, it's like, that's a great line. You know, he's getting a lot better. But Shaden Sharp played 30 something games this year. You know, it's like if Shaden Sharp was out there and, and you were seeing the chemistry between him and Scoot Henderson, there might be a little bit more excitement about what the Blazers are doing right now. So, you know, it's a combination of a lot of things. You can't watch the team. It's hard. Like not everybody, yeah. you know, you know, it used to be a lot easier to watch the Blazers play. It also used to be a lot harder to watch the Blazers play because of blazer vision, but we don't need to get into that right now. But it just, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of factors. It's kind of a perfect storm and the team's bad. The team is really, really, really bad. It does not have enough talent. Like they do not have enough guys to go out there and win games, especially with the number of people who are, injured right now another thing that popped into my mind that is even a difference between this year to last year last year you had the carrot of the nba draft Mm -hmm. this year that doesn't exist right like there's i this is such an uninteresting draft class coming up that it's not like you're like you know you you had victor and scoot and ingram or yeah, and Ingram in the last one, Brand Miller. Sorry, woo, I don't know where that came from. Um, Miller in the last one, and yeah, I I, scri- I switched a few things up there. Anyways, I know what I did now. Um, Brandon Miller, and there's no big name. You you the twins even. There's mm-hmm. no big name in this one. It's yep. just slogging away. So also as a Blazers fan, you know in the back of your mind, it's not like you're going to get a pick in this draft that is going to change things for next year. So, you know, kind of, unless something crazy happens next year, you know, oh, like, oh, maybe the starting lineup can actually be healthy for more than five games together. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's another thing that's factored in. This team has been so injured. It's insane. Um so that's hard to build up a fan fan base as is when you're just not getting any consistency out there on the court. So fans just don't under don't know the product you're putting out there every night. Um, but anyways, when you when you're also don't have that carrot of a big, you know, okay, we're tanking, but it's for this person. Yeah, that also well, makes people completely check out because they know that you've got at least another year of we're tanking. Well, and and next year is the year you want to be bad, frankly. Like you yes. want to be in that Cooper in that Cooper flag lottery uh, as well. So it's like, you know, yes, this is going to be a sustained process for the Blazers. Which, by the way, leads me to, you know, of the thing. Okay, what can change? You know, Chauncey Billups has one year left on his contract, and I, <laughs> I, I, I empathize with Chauncey Billups in that when he took this job. He had a team totally of, different. You know, 
well, it's a team of like a team of grownups, right? A yeah. team that was built to to go go get it, you know. And and you know, maybe it wasn't a championship roster. I mean, it certainly obviously wasn't. But you have Dame, CJ, uh, Norman Powell, Robert Covington, um, uh, Nurk. I mean, that's a team of adults that is like yep. you know you know mid career veterans. You know, that made sense for a guy like Chauncey Billups, right? Like all of a sudden he's a developmental coach and he's been a developmental coach for basically the entirety of his tenure. He's in year three of four. Um, is he coming back next year as a lame duck? Do the, I mean, do the, I, I don't get the sense the Blazers are, are looking to make a move with him. I don't know if it entirely no. makes sense to make a move with him, but I also don't know if I'm Chauncey Billups, do I want to go into next season without security beyond next year? Um, I don't know. I just, I, it's a, it's it's a, it's a tricky situation because, you know, I don't think Chauncey has done much to show you that he is the right guy or that he's a great basketball coach. But I also don't know that he's been in a situation where he's he's really been able to. I mean, the he things that Chauncey the Billups, tools. yeah, the things that Chauncey Billups is good at is you know being a leader, being a communicator. Um, you know, I think we've seen those things from him. I think we've seen him. Um, you know. I think we've seen him. I think you give him some credit for the way Shaden Sharp was developed and the way that Scoot Henderson has come along in his rookie year. I mean, you have to, you have to point to those things. But I mean, is there any reason to think that the Blazers have like the coach of their future right now? I sh- I don't see that in any way. No, no. There's there's. But no... does it make the? But does but... it make any sense to go f- try to find someone else right now when you don't know what your team is? Yeah. So you're just kind of stuck. Yeah, they're just they're they're in they're in purgatory right now. They are in basketball purgatory, and they will be in basketball purgatory at least for another year. So when you're a fan and you know that, you act accordingly. Mm-hmm. Which mm-hmm. means I got a million things pulling at me in my life, and if this something is is isn't pulling at me right now, all right, I've got other things to fill that void. You know, yeah. I've got other things to. And that doesn't mean that people aren't paying attention, but yeah, it's it's an interesting. There's a lot of reasons why this year is a very apathetic year. I mean, you know, I'll say it. How many games have I been to this year? How many full Blazers games have I been to this year as a media member? You want to take a stab, Bill? I know for me, it's way lower than I would have ever expected. Um, uh, two. I mean, I'm assuming it's more Dame. Dame. Dame's return. I came for Dame's return, and I was there for I was there for the opening night, but I had to leave because opening night was Mm -hmm. on a Friday, and I had to go shoot high school football. So both myself and my photographer went live pregame, and then we bounced. Mm -hmm. Because we didn't have a choice. We didn't. We don't have enough people in our newsroom for us to stay behind. Like we need him and I out there shooting games because if we aren't shooting games. We will not have high school football coverage on a Friday night. So, you know, it's it's that sort of thing where, um, you know, I mean, it, you know, it's even from a media perspective. We just haven't been around because there's other things that are pulling at me. And if I have to make a decision, I'm going to choose the other thing that seems like a bigger thing that week. Here we are. Yeah, it's it's really hard to believe that the Blazers can sort that the Blazers have sort of. You know, and, and maybe this is just my perspective as I've gotten older, but when I was, you know, when I was, you know, 20 years old, you know, it felt like, you know, the Bla- there was nothing bigger than the Blazers. The Blazers were still the, um, you know, they, that was the pinnacle of, of Oregon sports. And mm-hmm. obviously Oregon football has become a, a, a monstrous entity, but it does seem like that there has been sort of a gradual empathy with the trailblazers. And, and I, you know, I don't know. I might. I don't know if I want to introduce this concept. We should probably just sign off, but I'm going to, I'm going to say it. I don't entirely know if the city's love affair with Damian Lillard, which is real and it's authentic and it's great. I don't know if it ended up being great for the Blazers brand long-term yeah. because yeah. I think that the relationship, I don't know. I, I just don't know if I get the sense that like people are like all in on the Blazers, you know, once, once Dame's not there. And maybe that's just, again, a little bit of a, a scar that needs to heal a little bit, but it, it does seem like there, you know, the, the, the attachment became to Dame more than to the Blazers as, as, as a whole. Well, I think that's, 
just indicative of where we are right now as a society. I mean that that's that's not a that's not a novel concept for the Blazers. I mean, there's so many people that just cheer for players. They don't cheer for mm-hmm. teams anymore. They just follow their favorite player to where they go, which you know, to each their own. But yeah, that's everything you said makes total sense to me. And yeah, I think in some respects, a lot of people became bigger Damian Lillard fans than they became Blazer fans. Yeah. So that's how uh, you end up where you are today. Hmm. I think I asked you before we started podcast, recording, Brenna. Phil. I know. I, I, before we started recording, I asked you if there was any, if we had anything light to 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 go with, and uh, outside of outside of name that starting lineup and your name tag, I feel like we came up short. I do like name that starting lineup though as a game that uh, we might I might bring back in future years or oh future episodes. Just spontaneously name the 1982 starters. Uh, Calvin Nat, maybe. Um, I don't know. We'll. We'll, we'll workshop it a we little do. bit. In... Should we do the Life of Brenna segment from two weeks ago that we were going to do? We were going to do it, and then so much time elapsed, I worried that I it, that, we, that we'd lost your Life of Brenna um, momentum. Do we have a Life of Brenna update? Well, I mean, not really, but we can talk about the whole Dan Dockich thing if you want. That was pretty funny. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, talk about something that feels like it was nine lifetimes ago. I know, right? Uh, well, Br- Brenna, you caught a stray from yeah. uh, from Dan over um, in- in- internet personality Dan over uh, a tweet about the. I don't, I'm like, hold on, I'm gonna get there. I just can't even remember. Oh, it was yeah. the it was the it was it was Cal State Long Beach firing Long Beach. Fi- fi- yeah. yeah, there we go. Fi- fi- firing firing their coach. Your guy. Yeah, it was about and their AD basically try- saying that them firing their coach helped propel their NCAA tournament run, and kind of and trying to And you said to it was tone deaf. It. Yeah, you said it was tone deaf. And yeah, and then he said that Dan uh, Dan agreed. No- is- Dan, if you don't know who Dan Dockich is, folks, he's a former college basketball coach, um, who who morphed into an ESPN personality, who then got let go from ESPN because he said a numerous a nu- numerous amount of dumb things okay um not exactly someone known for his um accepting nature okay so yeah anyways um we were sitting in a press conference at oregon state when all of a sudden my phone lit up and it said that dan agreed with my point about the ad dan dan somehow found my tweet and said he agreed with the point about the ad and then said um and then called me a little tv dei hairspray which um, translates for people basically saying that I have my job because I am checking a box as a female. Um, and you know more than anybody, Bill, how I, I reacted to that, which was pure laughter. I thought it was the funniest thing of all time. You were like the first person I showed it to. I, I was right there. We were sitting in that little media room. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it was, I mean, it was it, it, kind of the ultimate stray from a very hateful and so ignorant random. place. And, and I don't, I, I guess the only thing I would say, it, and it, it, at the risk of giving this any more oxygen than it deserves, is I've been around just some like incredible women in sports media. And I don't think I've ever been around, you know, someone at like who I did not who it was not clear how they got their job and it was not from you know a, being a DEI hairspray it's because it takes a lot of really hard work and the people you see on television on the sidelines or wherever else you know have 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 worked a lot of hours put in a lot of time a lot have, have really had to grind to get to where they are I know that's certainly true of you you know in years in Great Falls Montana and Spokane um I'm forgetting one, right? Wasn't there a stop in there too? Reno, Reno, Reno. Um, you know, to get to get to where you are, and so um, I think that you know that sort of remark is. Uh, I thought it, it was really hilarious. trivialized. It's it just trivializes the amount of work that it takes to get to where uh, you are I in mean, your career. And so, I mean, I gotta say, funny, I've funny, been... funny that, but it's funny that somebody would actually confidently say something that stupid. More yeah, I mean, it was just, it was, it was just so out of nowhere that I was just like, this is hilarious. And, you know, he wanted, he wanted me to get angry with him, 
and I didn't. I just quote tweeted it, and I said I may have found a new line for my Twitter bio. I just I really checked; wanted... it's not in your Twitter bio. I know. I really wanted to do it, but I felt like I might. It might just be too much. Anyways, I really did want to do it though. Once called a little TV DEI hairspray by Dan Dockish. Um, I felt like that gave me some street cred. Uh, but anyways, so. Or it should yeah, at least get no. you a, a, a hairspray sponsorship. I know. Well, yeah, all the hairspray I use, none. Um, I was like, I didn't even use hairspray. Um, I, I gotta say, it's a creative insult at the very least. I've never been called a little hairspray before. Mm. Um, but yeah, you know what? I will say, in a lovely twist, um, it really actually was resp- like it ended up kind of becoming a uh, a positive for me because so many people said nice things about me online, which was very cool. So there you go. There's the positive See? spin in this podcast, The Life of Brenna. It really like helped, really felt really good. I mean, you know, it wasn't something that I was looking for at the time. It wasn't something that I was needing, but I was definitely, you know, just happy to like, yeah, it was, it was cool. So thank you, Dan. I appreciate, um, I appreciate your words because they inspired kind words. So there you go. Let's, let's, let's promote more kind words all around. <laughs> Um, and hopefully we'll have some next week when we come back. Hopefully the dust will have settled a little bit at Oregon State. Uh, we'll have a little bit of a postmortem on the Trailblazers, maybe some spring football. Um, Brenna, thank you so much for your time this fine Wednesday and look forward to talking to you soon. All right. See ya.